I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanono Show. Thomas returns. How are you doing, Thomas? I'm doing well. Thank you. All right. Um, this is long awaited. Last time we did a stream together, people asked, uh, you know, we're asking about books and things like that. So um, uh, I my idea was I told you before, right before we started recording was like um, books that every partisan should read and should be familiar with. So um, jump right in whenever you're ready. Yeah, I I was I always include the caveat. And I think people, I guess I come off as like annoyed at, or people perceive it that way because people are constantly asking me, like, I'll, I'll, I'll drop like a postulate about something, you know, like on, on the Spanish Civil War or about, you know, the Third Reich or about the war between the states. And they'll be like, what's a book recommendation on that? But what they mean is, you know, like, where can I find some sort of concise Cliff Notes version of you know, like the revisionist perspective of World War II or something like that doesn't exist, you know, um, so I'm constantly having to admonish people like, look, like not everything is in a book. There's not there's not like the big book of World War II and why why court narratives are wrong or there's not, you know, why the why the war between the states like wasn't about like people being mean to black people. You know, like it's there's not you're not going to find that. However. There are there are seminal texts that you kind of have to have a more than a rudimentary familiarity with to be considered an educated person. And like what books are used for is, you know, books are a tool. They, I mean, not only for, you know, not only they're a record of, you know, raw data and, you know, like literally historical record, but it's also, I mean, you use them as conceptual tools to, you know, to help identify variables and phenomenon, you know, that, that shape, you know, a, a conceptual horizon of an epoch, you know, for example, where they identify, you know, variables that, that, you know, constitute, um, as a causal nexus, you know, the reasons for, you know, historical events, you know, it'd be them like seminal or like rather prosaic. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, I want to include a caveat here too. Like I'm not dropping a list of this isn't some like top 10 list where, you know, like the answers to all of your questions about what's wrong with the way historical questions are presented or like found within these pages. That's not how it works, you know? Um, but uh, at the same time, again, I, I think for anyone to have any kind of meaning for anyone to be able to call themselves educated on political or, historical affairs like on the theoretical side you know they they'd have to be acquainted with these things i mean first and foremost you've got to read aristotle's politics not just all political philosophy in the western world derives from aristotle that's inarguable okay um the relationship between plato and aristotle and the kind of tension they're in and to what degree like Aristotle's a repudiation of Plato. That's another question and that deals mostly with metaphysics and things. Okay. And yeah, you can't extricate metaphysics from politics in some sort of discreet way. But the point is like, that's not, that's not what I'm up on for purpose of purposes of, of why I'm, of, of what I'm suggesting here. Like what I'm suggesting is that, you know, if you're talking about, if you're talking about the Western tradition of political philosophy, you're, you're, you're beginning with Aristotle. Okay. Um, and even 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 those who aim to break with aimed to break with Aristotle to greater or lesser degree, like they were in dialogue with them and and relying on the pre-Socratics and things. Okay, so the politics and uh, Nicomachean ethics have got to be on your list. And in order to put those things in context, there are secondary sources. You know, um, Leo Strauss and a guy named Joseph. Cropsey, there's this book called The History of Political Philosophy, which is an outstanding book. And it's not, it's not, it's not full of like Straussian bullshit or anything like that. It's like very much like a hard and fast sort of condensed version. I mean, it's a, it's a hugely voluminous book, but it's got a section, um, basically, uh, it begins like Zeno, Zeno, like, uh, Zeno and Heraclitus and it ends with, um, you know, Heidegger and, uh, and um 
I think uh, I can't remember who the final entry is, but it, it go it, it ends in the mid twentieth century. Um, but uh, that's that that I consider is is like a great like secondary resource, and um, you know the if you want if you want um, but Aristotle I think uh, any <clears throat> any translation that's worth anything is got is you know it's got a complete annotation such that you know you should be able to you know kind of get by with um without you know having to move mountains to you know put things in context by way of secondary sources um if you modern political theory um is the progeny of hobbes you've got to read leviathan okay um i think a leviathan Leviathan is a political philosophy, kind of like Moby Dick as a literature. It's like this daunting, voluminous, incredibly wordy tome. Okay, like, but it's there's nothing in it that's wasted, or there's nothing in it. There's not. There's nothing in it that's um that's superfluous. Um, there's Hobbes is a Hobbes is fascinating because on the one hand, you know, like I, I think of, I think of, I think of um, Carl Schmitt's relationship to Hobbes as being kind of like Marx's relationship to Hegel. You know, Schmitt very much repudiated um, Hobbes' ontology and kind of his, uh, you know, kind of, kind of what he posited about man and like anthropological terms. But um, Hobbes' description of authority and man's relationship to authority and uh, the essentially theological characteristics therein were and are tremendously insightful. And um, the, uh, for better, even if were that not true, um, you know, again, every, everything subsequent um, in, uh, you know, the enlightenment tradition, if you accept that sort of conceptual timeline, and um you know even um things that repudiated the the kind of modernist perspective and 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 you know on on the political side of things i mean like derives from hobbes as well so i'd say that um i'd say that uh leviathan should probably be number two um i uh machiavelli is the prince if you take like at least traditionally if you went to a liberal arts college and you took like political theory, that's one of the first books they'd assign you. It's not that there's such great insight in it. Um, I think it, you know, I, th I think it captures, it's just sort of a snapshot of uh, the European political mind, but it did represent the kind of, uh, it, it was the first book of its kind that was widely circulated among literate classes. Okay. Um, and obviously, like my list is going to be like heavy on political theory, <clears throat> such that some people might object, like you know, owing to their own sort of conceptual prejudices. Um, number four, I'd say probably uh, Hegel, um, a study of history. If um, Hegel is kind of like Marx. Nobody, I mean, aside from the fact that there's there's a kind of there's a perverse fear of and literal like association between the two thinkers, but Hegel is, is cited constantly, but almost nobody actually reads Hegel. Um reading Hegel, kind of like reading Aristotle, is is I, I think a lifelong endeavor. You know, and you'll you'll return to the same text again and again for clarity. And um because uh as one's own sort of um understanding um comes into high relief proverbially speaking you know you'll 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 come to understand more and more you know what is under discussion and what's a fundamental concern in hegelian thought but um if you're any if you're any kind of um if you're any kind of political theorist, 
um, you know, Hegel is a kind of like your meta, your starting point for like metaphysics. As metaphysics is 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 such that it it dovetails inextricably with the political, you know, and um, there's more than a kind of narrow overlap there. Um, my uh. I uh, I don't know. How you, I'd, I'd say I'd say for five or six, you should read the Federalist Papers. Not because there's like incredible wisdom there. Like there's really not. And other than Hamilton and Jay, like I don't get a lot out of the Federalist Papers in substantive terms. But if you want to understand kind of like the confused like pastiche of what supposedly you know was the underlying um, rationale for the American Revolution. Um, which really wasn't a revolution in any in any meaningful sense, you know. It um, I it, it got branded as such, and one of these kinds of romantic instincts of people like uh, Jefferson, who uh, you know, had had kind of an absurd and and distasteful reverence for Jacobinism. Um, but if you want to understand. Even to this day, although it's like faded because, you know, there's not there's not any like substantive discourse in America about anything of a uh, of, of real importance. But you, you do still see at least um, in the federal courts occasionally, you do still see like reasoning directly lifted um, from the Federalist Papers, you know, uh, the degree to which it's, you know, the, the degree to which that's cosmetic versus substantive, I mean, is arguable, but I think um, at least a once over. Um, and even this, this goes for people who are like, you know, in, in Europe as well, too, because obviously this, this, the occupation regime that they're unfortunately availed to is, uh, is, is the American regime. You know, I'd say that, and you can find, um, I mean, you could probably download like, like a PDF of the Federalist Papers, like in, in after like a two minute freaking Google search. You know, um, I'd um getting into the more esoteric, um, I'd say uh, Marcia Eliade, the Sacred and the Profane. I uh, I think is a very important book. Um, it's um. I uh I really I really get a lot of the stuff like Rene Guillon too, but I that's that's I wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's essential uh reading for most people unless they're deeply intrigued by comparative theology as well as um you know what I think of as kind of deep uh politics, you know, the kind of the kind of conjunction of um of anthropological and cultural phenomenon with the political but um the sacred and the profane uh it very much bears on the 20th century um and uh i think uh it's a it's a splendid rebuttal to um this kind of preference for for secularism that uh you find among uh that you find among the postmodern right um, at least that's one of the reasons I initially gravitated towards Marcia Eliade. Um, he's written a bunch of other, he wrote a bunch of other stuff too. Like he wrote a book called Shamanism that was great. He wrote a book on, called The Myth of uh, Eternal Recurrence, um, which is great. Um, but not, um, but again, those kinds of things were only obliquely related to the topic at hand. Um I'd uh <clears throat> Carl Schmidt's Nomos of the Earth is essential reading. If you want to understand the world system post Westphalia, um the book I'm writing now about international jurisprudence since World War II, I consider it I intended to be a complement piece or a successor to Nomos of the Earth. Um it's inarguable that the world system is is fundamentally uh, grounded in in juristic reasoning, and that's why the seat of sovereignty vests in the judiciary now, and not not in any not not in the executive branch of government. 
and it's it's that way like on a planetary scale okay i mean there's the every every government on this planet is is structured basically the same you know like that's one of the reasons as we talked about it's ridiculous people talk about democracy versus not democracy as if this is still the cold war um and yeah obviously there's systems where you know the executive branch wields more power than others actually or 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 symbolically but um the, the the rationale of 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 government activity um in war and peace terms is is inextricably it, it, it derives from juristic reasoning and that's that's inescapable and um if for no other reason that's why one should read nomos of the earth um it's voluminous it's about five or six hundred pages but it's um I mean, it's a dense read, but it's actually highly readable. Um, and it's um, it better than any, it, it puts post-war political order in context um, better than any other kind of single volume. A lot of people, what pops up again and again, like the Carl Schmitt text that pops up on most people's lists is the concept of the political, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually, I believe, the concept of political was a lecture, uh, like a, a two or three lecture series that was transcribed. Um, and uh, it's it's not, I mean, it's, yeah, it's important, okay, because that's like the political, that's the ontology that underlies like the Schmidtian perspective. But um, it's not, um, it, it's a very, it's a very incomplete understanding if you're just going to read like one one Carl Schmidt text. And I, like, like I said, I think his, plus no of the earth was, his, his like post-war, uh, kind of like magnum opus, you know, it puts, it puts the experience of the, of the first half of the 20th century in perspective. Um, it, um, and as a, um, as a follow-up to that, um, or as a compliment to that, I, I, I'd suggest anybody who considers themselves right wing, um read imperium by francis yaki um i don't consider imperium to be as esoteric as some people do um maybe that's because of my background in terms of what i always kind of gravitated to instinctively um as regards like theoretical texts and things like that but um for those that aren't as familiar with sort of um the source material that yaki's relying on there's a book called profit and decline by a guy named john Ferenkopf. he's an independent scholar um who for a long time was based here in chicago this book profit and decline is both like an intellectual biography of oswald spangler as well as kind of um kind of a like an abridged explanation of, of his whole body of work and core concepts. Um, you know, I, it, uh, because frankly, it's not in the cards. I think for a lot of people to read, uh, the two volumes or three volumes of decline of the West in its original form. Um, and then, um, you know, kind of, kind of pour over that in Imperium, like some kind of scholastic and and try and decipher um you know the the context. Um I'd uh <clears throat> I'd um I'd say uh George Sorrell is a uh, essential reading. Um I can't remember if we're on number six, number seven. Sorrell's Reflections on Violence. Um, I think pretty much everything Sorrell wrote is worth reading, but Reflections Reflections on Violence um, is, uh, is is highly significant to um, um, to, to, revol to, to any revolutionary paradigm. Um, as, and as well as... Uh, um there's if there's some editions that have kind of a there's this essay on um 
Sorel uh, wrote a great essay on why on why Socrates deserved to be executed. Um, and uh, that's of peculiar significance to the radical right, um, like it, it like it all in all times. Um, and it also um, it distinguishes the partisan from the radical, and you know that's there's there's all kinds of like remarkable stuff there. Um, some people who I think probably haven't actually read Sorel, or they or they've read read him but don't fully understand the context. Like they seem they seem to like look at Sorel as some like heterodox socialist, or I mean, and he was that too. But that's not really the key takeaway. Um, he's not just Werner Sombart, but with uh, but but with a a kind of um anthropological streak interspersed therein um he's one of the he's one of the most um i'd say i i, I put him on a par with, with with lenin in terms of uh his understanding of uh praxis um in uh within a revolutionary paradigm um i'd uh this is probably going to strike some people as peculiar, but um, I'd uh, I'd include "Men Among the Ruins" by Julius Evola. That's a remarkable book, and um, I think a lot of Evola's other stuff. <clears throat> it's certainly not a waste of time to read it, but um, it's totally different than "Men Among the Ruins," and specifically the edition that was put out by Inner Traditions Publishing House, which is Michael Moynihan's outfit or it was um because that that one contains a lot of stuff that was later redacted by for whatever reason by like various publishers but the men among the ruins it's it's it, it it's it's lacking in evola's uh kind of like symbolic his musings on symbolic psychology and metaphysics and things and all of that uh it's very much diagnostic um in character and uh it's about the best description of the european political situation in the later cold war um that i've come across and it uh it's it's very very accessible um so long as somebody has a rudimentary understanding of of the great war in world war ii um it's a remarkable book um i'd uh The King James version of the Bible is essential reading, even if you're not a Protestant, even if you're not religious. Um, it's uh, arguably um, the most significant text written in the English language. And um, if you want to, like the Anglophone kind of inner world um conceptually it derives from uh it derives from aristotle it derives from stuff like arthurian legend and it derives from the king james bible which is kind of a which which is kind of a conceptual reality into itself i can't explain it any better than that um and it's um it's very different than every other translation, which, uh, you know, people, people argue about the soundness of that theologically. That's not important. I mean, it is important. Okay. But like for purposes I'm talking about, um, it, uh, it, um, it warrants a, uh, a, um, a secular reading. Um, if you're, uh, if you're a, a white Westerner in, in an Anglophone culture, um and finally um <clears throat> because uh people constantly ask me for like some seminal revisionist third reich book if you're only going to read one like revisionist history book on the third reich um john tolan's biography of adolf hitler is essential reading um tolan was the was the hitler biographer okay um 
David Irving is is like the scribe of the Third Reich, but of Hitler himself, it's John Toland. Okay, and um, his biography is just that. It's the life of Adolf Hitler, um, and um, Toland is the only historian who Hitler's family was willing to speak to. Like it's fate kind of conspired to assign Toland to that role, as is often the case with historical writers. As I age, I realize more and more that that's true. It's not. some sort of self uh, created mythology that, um, you know, um, historical authors have, have kind of crafted about their, their endeavors. Um, off the top of my head, that's, um, that's about the best list I can come, I can come up with. Um, well, let me ask, what about fiction? <clears throat> Frank Herbert's Dune um, is a uh, is essential, and you've got to read Dune as a uh, like a complete like body of work um, because uh, it's um, I mean science fiction is a is a medium for political theory at base. I mean as as well as other things. Um, that's one of the reasons I spend so much time with it, like reading it. And that's why, you know, a lot of very, a lot of very strong people, you know, possess a very strong intellect of like have taken it seriously. Um, and Herbert's a perfect example of that. Um, it's 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 a great, it's an outstanding philosophical discussion of you know historical time. Um, I'd say uh, that that that's that's at the top that's at the top of my list. Like read the Dune books and read them in order. Um, the book uh, Dead City by Shane Stevens. That's uh, that's the best uh, that's the best like gangster like book ever written. Um, like it's a it's a rough book. It's very brutal, but that's 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 what the street was like and. Uh, the early seventies. Um, and Shane Stevens was a guy who you can tell from his, you can, you can tell from his writing that this was like stuff that he witnessed. And these were like people that he knew, you know, like it's, um, it's, um, it's like, like I, I mentioned to people that, uh, the best gangster movies of all time, in my opinion, are Carlito's way and mean streets and, um, dead cities, like in that vein, you know, like it's, it's, um, it's uh it's kind of like the anti Hollywood gangster novel. Um it's somewhat hard to find these days. Um there's a lot of overpriced paperbacks. Um but I can probably I can probably find a PDF or a, like a reasonably priced paperback if 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 people hit me up because they can't um because they can't find it. Um I'd uh <clears throat> Wuthering Heights definitely belongs on that list. Um I mentioned it before, like people probably think that sounds like fruity or something, and I mean I mean whatever, like I don't I, I don't I don't care if people think that. Um that's um that's the best uh literary treatment of uh the tragedy and character of romantic love in uh, the English language, and um, and there's something uh, it, it deals it deals with, with like what properly is like supernatural. I don't mean like ghosts and goblins and stuff. I mean the, you know, um, there is a there there is um there there is something mysterious about eros um and um i think it's the best uh i think it's the best best treatment of that um there's go ahead there, there's a book that i've heard we've never even talked about it but there's a book i've heard you mention on other um other shows and your own um of human bondage yeah yeah that's that's definitely on my list too by uh, Somerset Mom. 
Yeah, that's a fantastic book, man. And it um it's uh it's uh that that definitely is something every 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 young person especially should read. Um <clears throat> I'd also uh I'd also um there's a book called uh Armor by John Stakely, um, which is sort of a it's sort of like a spiritual counterpart to Starship Troopers, but I think it's I think it's a lot better, frankly. Like um Highline wrote some fascinating stuff. Um and uh but he was kind of like a pure uh he uh he got very strange later in life, Heinlein did. Um and um I mean that's fine. Like some of his some of his weirder wilder shit, like the number of the beast, I actually got a kick out of, but um his um starship troopers is uh is very much uh is, is very much military science like hard advanced military science and like a fanciful setting to you know facilitate you know kind of like discussion they're in armor is very is a is very much is a much more complete book i think on a on, on a similar subject you know um and and kind of like the the dehumanizing aspects of uh of a, uh, you know, of um, of hyper advanced warfare, but um, I uh, for for reference, the uh, Stigley died uh, rather young. <clears throat> His only other novel was uh, Vampires, which is what Carbon John Carpenter based his movie Vampires on, which is not a terrible adaptation, but the book is way better. And uh, basically, in the novel, like vampires are a real thing, but they're like vampirism is like a is like a is like a disease organism. And these these guys who are basically like Blackwater, they get retained by the Vatican to kill vampires when its infestations are, are discovered, which is obviously like a very kind of tough and disgusting job. And like that's it's basically like about like just kind of these guys' lives or like these PMCs who destroy vampires. It's really fucking cool. Um, and again, there's some of that, like in the in the film, but it's it's uh, but uh, that and uh, though that and armor were like Stakely's only two novels. So I mean, he he was um, he, he's very much like a cult kind of novelist in part because had he lived, I think he was only like 38 when he died. Wow. There there would have been like very very good stuff emergent from um, his creative mind, I think. Um, yeah, Carpenter's Vampires is pretty decent. Um... I mean, we can get off on vampire movies now. What would you think of Near Dark? Near Dark's great. Um, <laughs> and it's like, uh, what's well, like I always telling people, like, there's a, there's a, like, 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 fags, like the Lost Boys, like, real motherfuckers, <laughs> like, Near Dark. Just like, just like fucking Menace to Society is, like, real shit. And Boys in the Hood is, like, maudlin, like, pathetic shit. And, like, real people, like, Romper Stomper and, like, fucking, and fucking, and, uh, you know, lames are into like American History X. It's like that kind of deal. Like, um, I actually think um, the uh, the Cl- the Klaus Kinski um version of Nosferatu, um, which was released in '79. I mean, Werner Herzog directed it, but Klaus Kinski plays uh, Count Orlock, which is appropriate because Klaus Kinski probably is like a vampire. But like, uh, that's probably my favorite vampire movie. Um. And um, speaking of John Carpenter, the John Carpenter TV movie of Salem's Lot is actually pretty dope. And like when I was a little kid, like a little little kid, they'd always show it on TV, and I found it really scary. And then like uh, as an adult, like it, it actually holds up. It's it's pretty cool. Um, Let me ask you about this one because I know you like I know you like the lead actor in it. So um, what do you think of the hunger? It's, it's it's pretty dope, man, and it uh. The hunger is interesting, not just because, uh, not just because of like the David Bowie connection, but it's, um, I think, uh, I think Whitley Stryber wrote it and he was very weird, man. And, you know, he, he wrote some interesting stuff in the eighties. He wrote the Wolfen. He wrote this book war day, which is exactly what it sounds like. It was like, his, you know, it was kind of like his take on, you know, um, a general nuclear war. Um, I mean, he mostly focused on like the sociological and cultural aspects, you know, like the human side. But Stryber, 
he began insisting that he was having contacts with alien beings, you know, and then like communion, you know, that he wrote that book that they made into a movie for Christopher Walken. He really like went off the rails. But um I believe he wrote the book that uh, the hunger was adapted into. The hunger very much um it's where it, the aesthetic of it is like super 1981 and like that just like the very very early 90s were kind of like neither the 80s nor like the proper 90s like the very very early 80s are kind of a weird time you know it was like uh it, it, was, it was like not quite post-punk not quite new wave like styles were weird you know um I mean, Bauhaus opens up the show, opens up the yeah, movie. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, well, it's the kind of movie that like never be made today, let alone by, let alone by, um, let, you know, let alone by like a, a major studio or, or whatever, you know, like it, um, like if a movie like that were made, it would be like a guy like Ryan Gosling would like just like throw money at it to like, as like a, you know, something he wanted to make. And it would, it'd be like a, like a very limited release. Like that's another. It, yeah, and that's not that's another th- thing. The reason that epoch was cool is because you'd see just like random stuff like that. Like, um, do you think it was uh, there was like this underlying judgment of like Upper West Side wasps, Upper East Side wasps? It, uh, yeah, I think that was part of it. Um, yeah, I, I think that was part of it. Definitely, and um, that's why it's always um, any. It was a weird, um, like post Ford administration, New York City, like that setting. There's, um, there was a lot of, yeah, there was a lot of, um, there, there's like cast dynamics that were present there that were not in like Chicago or in Los Angeles. You know, it's, it's a, it's, um, like the, the East Coast is different, man. It just is, you know, like I, but it's, um, I love to rewatch it. I haven't seen it, I think, and since I was, um, since I was in college, it's um, but the also the the reason I like Near Dark so much, um, what it is going for it is a, uh, it's like obvious, like like it's very on those metaphor for like being an addict, and like in Near Dark they never even say what the vampires are. It's just it just becomes obvious like that's what they are, but they're like these um, but they're like these, they're like these outlaw like grimy white people. They're like these peckerwoods who like live like addicts. You know, and um, there's also a lot of passing jokes in it. Like I remember when they when they set fire to that one place, and they're they're leaving, and Bill Paxton goes, "Remember that fire we set in Chicago?" Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's also too like when um when the girl first turns the the kid played by Adrian Pashtar, like when he starts getting sick, he's like getting dope sick, and that's like the narc in the bathroom is like, "Look, man, I I know what's I know what I know what I know what's going on here." Like you know. Get get your shit together. Don't let me see her again. He's like he's like obviously coming down on him because he's like, oh, you're a junkie. And it's like even if they don't like they, you know, if the, if the vampires don't get what they need, they get dope sick and like it's um. And he uh, like at first uh, at first the kid finds like the entire process disgusting, but they're just like, look, like you'll, you'll like get used to it. You know, you you end up being able to do things you never thought yourself capable of. Like that's. That's very much um because like being a vampire actually is disgusting and it sucks. You know, like that and that's like it's and that you know, that's why um I uh I've, I've always found that to be an apropos metaphor. And like if you're an addict, you truly like do like live at night, you know, and like uh you're 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 almost like afraid of daytime, not just because you know, because like you know you'll be sick in the morning and like that's when the police are around and that's you know when you, you've got to, you, you know, you've got to like be aware of people finding out what you are and coming down on you and shit. Like that, I mean, that's why I, um, I mean, I've always liked Near Dark. I, I liked it even before I understood that implication. And, um, the uh, Catherine Bigelow, who was, um, and she was a real fucking dying piece back in the day, but she, um, she's an interesting filmmaker, man. And, um, she's a she's a rare uh like female female uh directors who have really good directing chops like they're rare i mean it's just like a fact i'm not saying that's like 
come down on females or something. But the but those that do are good at their craft are like very very good at it. Um, like Lenny Reifenstahl comes to mind too, obviously. But um, did you ever think that um, because you mentioned Klaus Kinski and it reminded me of of Natasha. Did you ever think cat people was like some weird kind of supposedly supposed to be? I don't like cat people, and like I people have, have have challenged me on that because I like Paul Schrader so much. Um, I I don't know what he was going for with that. The original cat people was this kind of was this kind of camp horror movie from you know the nineteen forties. Paul Schrader's version. Um, it it it's kind of like it's kind of like a Shaggy Dog story. It doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> And um, you know, it's it's kind of the consummate uh it's kind of the consummate example of style over substance. But I mean Schrader kind of lost his way for a minute. Like I think I think American Gigolo was like a shitty movie. You know, like and I don't and that's one of the ones that kind of put him on the map of like mainstream movie goers. You know, and that that's and that's the movie that also like made like Richard Gere. But like I I uh but I mean, I, 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 I like his, I like hardcore. I like the Yakuza, like those, are like my favorite Paul Schrader movies. And, um, I think, uh, and then later in life, uh, like autofocus, you know, which is the Bob Crane biopic, which is really kind of yeah. disturbing. Like that's it's a great a, film. It's a great film, but it is very disturbing. Yeah. Defoe is, like, Defoe is really creepy in that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, the, uh, well, it's also, um, it, uh, but it's like even one of the reasons I like autofocus and stuff is because like the like the optics of it are really good and like in, in cat people it's like the optics are just like shitty it like looks like some like it looks like a 1980s like like car commercial or something like I don't it's I've tried to watch it again during the um I think during like last year during Frody's like film festival I think somebody watched cat people. It was on my mind. What I'm getting, I, I can't remember. Somebody reviewed it like in our circle, like a year or two ago, and so it was like on my mind again. And I think Ace like asked me if I liked it or not, and I'm like, no, I thought it sucked, but I'll I'll try watching it again, <laughs> you know. And then um, I, I I tried it. I I I gave it another chance. I'm just like, I don't. This is just this is just a shitty movie, man. It was it's, it um, was like it wanted to be either a vampire movie or a werewolf movie, and it was. It, it, it couldn't make up its mind what it was. Yeah, it didn't go anywhere. You know, like that's like I said, like it wasn't. Um, and I speculate, I speculate the the narrative problems were because it was one of those scripts that got like endlessly like slashed and burned and and like edited just kind of into oblivion. And then like what the final product was like didn't really make any sense. I mean, that might not have been Trader's fault, but again, um, what kind of what kind of grab me about it is that it's just not. It's just like not optically like a good movie. It, no. um... I got one more. I, I got one more movie for you, and we'll get out of here. Yeah, Robert Harmon, nineteen eighty six, The Hitcher. See that film starts out really strong, and um, it's like uh, Rucker Howard is like so weird that like he he's just speaking of like Klaus Kinski. He's kind of like is is sort of like uh spiritual counterpart or something but it's um the suspense kind of gets blown like halfway through the movie like when it like because the, because the kid finally is able to like convince like the police that like this guy actually is after him and um you like like the like the movie the first half of the movie is like dope because it's like it's like this like hitchcock type nightmare where, like the kid it's, it's he can't convince anybody this insanity is actually really happening but then, like it, but but then the movie kind of like shoots its load, um, and and then it just becomes a, you know, like like almost like a slasher movie, um, and C. Thomas Howell's in that, right? Yep. C. Yeah, C. Thomas, Thomas Howell. Howell actually, and Jennifer, yeah. I think Jennifer Jason Lee too. Yeah, yeah, and that was um, C. Thomas Howell's got more range than uh, Samuel credit him with, and uh, I uh. But yeah, I think um, I know that like among like midnight movie fans and stuff, like back in the old days as well as today, like it's it's kind of like beloved. But I um, I don't. Uh, 
I don't care for it. What was on the tip of my tongue a minute ago with Catherine Bigelow was I believe she also directed The Loveless, you know, which was with William Defoe, and that was um that's like rockabilly like leather jacket stuff. So I think it's cool. Um, but it's like it's done right. Like it's uh, and it's like it's kind of like the anti Streets of Fire, which which I hate. Um, <laughs> I'll never forgive Walter Hill for making that piece of shit. You don't like John uh, Perry? <laughs> he, he, like he, he's goofy and like that whole um, that whole the whole movie is just awful and cringe. But the Loveless, uh, he also did Eddie. He was a star of Eddie and the Cruisers, too. right? And then <laughs> Eddie and the Cruisers had this bizarre sequel too that like came out like ten years later and it was uh, in Canada. It was like based in Canada and everything. Yeah, and it was yeah. bizarre too because like it's uh. Like the, the the whole they're supposed to be this like nineteen sixties band, but they sound like a nineteen eighties band. They sound like and spring. Like, they always sound like spring yeah, theme, circa yeah, seventy nine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're like these guys. They're like these. They're like these dudes with mullets and like skinny ties playing like Bruce Springsteen songs. They're like from the sixties, and then like yeah, and then like Eddie fakes his death for like twenty years, which is like lame as fuck, <laughs> you know. And like because uh, he's like tired of being famous, so he just like decides it's like. It's like okay, motherfucker. Like the fact I, that that trope is so stupid too. It's like, yeah, I'm sick of being rich and famous. I'm gonna go like work at, as a Walmart reader because like that'll be awesome. Like, uh, it's um, like unless, unless you're like the a tortured, the tortured artist. Yeah, unless you got like five star heat, like you you don't fucking fake your own death. You know, like that's that's fucking retarded. So I, I wanted to ask you this because we mentioned Howard on in the Hitcher. Besides, um, obviously leaving out Blade Runner. What's his best movie? That's a good question. I think um, I uh, I don't have to think about that in a minute. My the, uh, my like um, I guess guilty pleasure movie is the Blade Night, Heroes Nighthawks. Oh, uh, yeah, Nighthawks is actually a pretty good movie, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's corny, but it's um, it's uh, like like it's actually a pretty intelligent script. And um, I think uh, what uh, yeah, I'd have to think about it, man. Like, how, how, Retro Hour's been in a lot of weird stuff. Like um, there's like this one like movie that Dave's always show on Cinemax where he's like this blind samurai. I mean that that movie's really fucking stupid, but it's just oh like, a yeah, weird script. yeah. And he um, what the hell was that? It's called Blind Fury. Yeah. And then um. Yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to think about. Um, it, um, I actually like a guilty pleasure of mine is Split Seconds, which speaking of movies that don't make any sense, like Rutger Hauer, he's a he's like this mercenary, like he's like this PMC type in London, um, and in London the future it's like flooded, um, and there's like this there's like this serial killer like alien that's like ripping people's hearts out, and um. It's not clear if it's like like it, the movie doesn't make any sense, but uh, it's got it's you know it's got like that uh, it's got like that Predator Two kind of aesthetic where there's like just like tons of guns and just like insanity. Um, like my my Rutger Hauer guilty pleasure is Split Second. Well, remember he did that movie Fatherland too. Fatherland's actually dope. Um, like obviously like the uh, the the Holocaust trope I, is is kind of like the the plot device is lame but um but that film's optics are great and um the uh administratively the way like the third race organizing makes perfect sense you know, that's why like you know he's um he's a uh, he's a creepo investigator you know criminal police uh, but he's uh he's got algamine ss rank because like they're under the penumbra of the sd and like mm -hmm. i and like when they're on the I, I find that very very cool, man. Like uh, you know, it came out when I was in high school or like just out of high school. I think it was released in '94 on HBO, and like I'd read the book when it came out. And um, Did, I he was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? He's done a <laughs> bunch of weird stuff, man. Like I said, it's like the Bloody Heroes. I saw it in the theater. It's uh, it's got Vincent D'Onofrio and and um, Hugh Keys Burn, and that's like that's like a nuclear war, um these gladiators they go town to town playing this like game that's like it's like pigskin football but use a dog skull and you can like you know you like gore people with chains and stuff um yeah he he's a he's a guy who definitely was not afraid to take like take unusual scripts man 
Um, and the same year, '94, that he that I think he did Fatherland. <laughs> he did that movie with Ice T, Surviving the Game. <laughs> yeah, that was that, that's that's when like they made up they made a million one movies that were based on like the most dangerous game. There's like a Van Damme movie that like has the exact same plot, where uh, where like these 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 guys like are hunting Van Damme. Um, yeah. Well, all right, let's get out of here. What do um what do you got to plug? Um. Oh, good. Uh, great episode. Um, introductory episode for uh, season two. No, thank you, man. Yeah, I, like I said, I'm, I'm pleased my workflow is actually getting moving. And, and again, I, I apologize, man, for shit being so... I mean, not just to you, to like all the freaking subs and everybody watching this. Um, this winter has been like hard on me, man. Like I'm not trying to play martyr. I'm saying this why I like my workflow has been foobar. But you can always find it, the kind of like one stop spot for my work product and my content is thomas777.com it's number seven hmas 777.com you can find me on x capital r-e-a-l underscore number seven hmas 777 um and of course substacks where the pod is and where um my longer form stuff is and i'm gonna drop some i'm gonna drop uh some stuff on there this week i think people will be intrigued by it's a uh, real thomas 777.substack.com um i am gonna populate my youtube channel with some video content but like i said man i've been this this winter has like been fucking really hard um but i i, I am on the man i'm gonna start shooting in earnest in the next couple of weeks video awesome. content i mean awesome man thank you very much yeah Appreciate thank you man it. yeah